All right, so in this video, we're going to talk about a structural phenomenon known as the Jan Teller theory, um, also called Jan Teller distortion. What this theorem says is that uh, any nonlinear molecule in a degenerate electronic state, um, what does that mean? It means an electron configuration that has more than one uh, uh, possible configurations with the same energy, right, degenerate. Any nonlinear molecule in a degenerate electronic state will distort as to lower the symmetry of the molecule and, of, and, and thus removing the uh, electronic degener degeneracy. Um, it doesn't tell you what type of distortion will happen. It's a, it's a geometric distortion, but oftentimes there's many different uh, lower symmetry geometries that you can go to. Uh, most of the time, in fact, there are. And this theorem makes no prediction about which one will occur. So in lifting the degeneracy, that is lowering the symmetry, uh, electrons may occupy lower energy orbitals, resulting in a lower overall energy state for the system. That is the rationale behind the on teller effect, OK? Um, and kind of a corollary of this is that the perfect geometries, right, um, can't exist as stable species for certain electronic configurations uh, because distorted the distorted molecule is actually energetically preferred. So that is to say, octahedral, for example, um, or tetrahedral, OH and TD, or D4H, a lot, for certain electron configurations that are degenerate, this is actually an approximation of their true structure, okay? And so let's take the example of uh, an octahedral complex, okay? So we know that for a perfectly symmetrical octahedral complex, it's gonna have point group OH, right, with six identical ligands. Um, and, and there's going to be you know, all the symmetry elements that an octahedron has. And what this um, results in is a splitting of the D orbitals into three T2G orbitals that are lower in energy than the two EG orbitals. Okay, that's fine. Um, and so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna identify which octahedral ground state configurations um, are going to be subjected to this Jan Teller effect. And the way we're gonna do this is by looking at if there's any degeneracy um, with the possible electronic configuration that we're talking about. If there is degeneracy in the electronic configuration, i.e. there are multiple ways you can put the electrons down that have the same energy, um, then we are predicting that we will see some sort of Jan Teller distortion. Um, if there's no uh, electronic degeneracy, then there won't be any non teller distortion, and perfect octahedral geometry is what we're predicting will happen. So here's an example. You have a D1 configuration, and uh, this D1 configuration, of course, the ground state's going to be in the T2G. This one electron's going to be in the T2G. But there are actually three different orbitals that you can put this uh, T2G uh, electron, right? It, it's equally valid to write it any of these ways. and so. Another way of saying that is this D1 configuration is triply degenerate. And because it has uh, some de degeneracy, uh, there is going to be yon teller distortion. Another example would be a D2 configuration. That's gonna have two electrons in the T2D. Well, there's also three ways to write that. These are shown here, right? Um, and so it's also triply degenerate. So you are also going to have yon teller distortion. And so you can go through here and look at what configurations have degeneracy, um, what type of degeneracy it is. And uh, you can see basically when you have um, gaps, okay, in, in where the electrons are in the T2Gs, uh, what does that mean? I, I mean, uh, you don't have a T2G3 where they're all, you know, unpaired uh, and filling up the T2G TG, like as a half shell type of thing, or you don't have T2G6. All of those are gonna be triply degenerate. There's three ways that you can write them. So they're all shown here. You can work through these if you want. Um, and then if you have gaps in the EG, right, these are gonna be doubly degenerate. So what does that mean? That means if you have um, not a half, <clears throat> not a half filled EG, right, to unpaired electrons, or if you don't have um, a totally filled EG, i.e. four electrons in the EGs. Okay, so those are going to be doubly degenerate. And then all the other electron configurations are not going to be degenerate at all. There's only going to be one 
way that you can uh, write them down. So these would be cases where you have everything half filled, okay, like a D3 case where the T2G is half filled, or a high spin D5 where both the T2G and the ED are, are half filled, or you have uh, filled cases, okay. Um, D6, low spin is an example, right, T2G6, uh, all the T2G is totally filled, or D10, both the T2G and the EG are filled, so there's only one way to write those. The D8, the T2G is filled, and the EG is half filled, okay? So um, what's even neater about this theorem is that you can predict something about the magnitude of the distortion. And so um, triply degenerate uh, states in when we're talking about octahedral complexes will exhibit weak Jan Teller distortion. Um, doubly degenerate states will have a stronger effect. There will be more of a distortion away from the octahedral symmetry. And the non-degenerate ones we already said will not have any effect. Why is this? Why is there a difference between strong and weak if they're doubly or triply degenerate? Well, the, the doubly degenerate ones all have to do with you know, asymmetry in the EG orbitals, right? And remember, we want to go back to the crystal field theory splitting of octahedral complex video, we talked about how the EG orbitals are higher in energy um, because their ligands are, are pointed more directly at the orbitals. So there's more electron-electron repulsion there. That's why they're higher in energy. So if you can alleviate this electron-electron repulsion by splitting up the degeneracy by lowering the symmetry, okay, uh, uh, that is going to be a, a bigger driving force for that. So there's going to be a stronger effect. The T2Gs, right, aren't um, interacting as directly with the ligands. And so it's, it's a much weak, weaker effect. All right, so what about in practice? What are we going to be doing? So for octahedral complexes, um, what you can do is you can take the axial li ligands, and you can, uh, this is the simplest type of Jan Teller distortion that there is. You can either elongate the ligands or you can compress them. And if you do that, uh, the point group, uh, goes down, okay, in symmetry, now you've gone from OH, perfect octahedron, to D4H, okay? Because um, you, you, you no longer have multiple C4s, basically. There's only one C4 uh, going through those axial ligands. So you can compress them, or you can elongate the axial ligands, and in either case, that's gonna give you D4H. Jan Teller theorem doesn't tell you what, whether or not you're gonna have elongation uh, or compression of the axial ligands or something else. Okay, it just tells you whether or not something's going to occur. So uh, when you have cases where you have strong young te young Teller uh, uh, effects, right, doubly degenerate, like D9, D9 was a doubly degenerate one, right? Look at our table here; it's doubly degenerate. We're going to have strong young Teller. So copper two complexes are D9. Um, you actually can see this in crystal structures. So this is, um, you know. Kind of walking you through a crystal, what a crystal structure of, of uh, a hexa aqua copper two complex looks like, and you can see the axial bond lengths are significantly longer than the um, equatorial copper oxygen bond lengths. But this is a D of the D4H point group, um, at least around the central atom, right? And so, uh, very good evidence that you know this strong Jan Teller effect is occurring. If you have weak Jan Teller effect, a lot of times uh, you won't see it necessarily in a crystal structure, but it, it because it's kind of fluctional and it's maybe going through a lot of different types of Jan Teller effects and in a crystal structure they could average out or the effects will just be much weaker. Um, it just, there's enough room temperature energy a lot of times in solution uh, to sort of uh, average these weak effects out. All right, so, if we're talking about splitting of the d orbital degenerates, um, uh, uh, how are these orbitals going to split when we're moving to d4h? Um, and this is this is just showing you that uh, if you look at the character table, you can figure this out, right? Because you can look at the d orbital um, functions, right? And here they are. So we pull up the d4h character table, and we can see it. ah, what used to be t2g now is bg, and then two egs, right? And what used to be um, uh, EGs, the DZ squared and the DX squared minus Y squared, now it's an A1G and a B1G. So what you can do is you can draw a, a sort of a per, what, what's called a correlation diagram, okay, um, where we're now we, we derive this or, or explain the origin of this octahedral splitting diagram. Now we can 
actually go from the octahedral uh, diagram, use this concept beyond Teller distortion, and derive the D4H diagram from it. And that's what this is showing. Um, you can see, right, the EG has two orbitals. One of them is going down by certain values called delta 1. OK, in this case, it doesn't really matter what you call it. But it goes down by some value. And the other one's going to go up by, by the same value. And if you think about compression, it makes sense if you're doing compression. It makes sense that this dz squared should go up in energy. That should be the one that's going up in energy because the lobes of the dz squared are directly acting with those axial ligands. And so if you move those ligands further uh, in, there's going to be more electron electron repulsion moving this up in energy. And if this one moved up in energy, well, the x squared minus y squared has to move down in energy because everything has to uh, equal at the Berry center, right? The, the overall energy has to be equal, right? Similar thing with the T2Gs. Um, the T2Gs, we said, are going to split into a set of two and one. And if you look at the XZ and the YZ, well, those um, are, have the Z plane in them. So if you're moving those Z uh, uh, ligands closer to these orbitals, there's going to be more repulsion. So those are going to go up by a certain factor, in this case, like a value of one third, right? And then that means that the other one has to go down by a factor of two thirds, right, to balance things out. Um, elongation is going to do the exact opposite. Okay, now it's the z squared that's going to go down. Ah, yes, you you've really alleviated a lot of electron electron repulsion by bringing those z ligands out of the way, the axial ligands, and that means the x squared minus y squared has to go up. And then these are also flipped in, in the same idea. So elongation and compression of an octahedral system to give you a d4h system is kind of one and the same, except that the it's their opposite effects, okay? They're complementary effects in terms of the, um, the energy splitting. Um, and so what you can actually see happening here is you can trace this out and you can think about, well, what happens if I actually elongate forever? So this was elongating just a little bit. What happens if I elongate forever? Well, if I elongate forever, the atoms are gone. They're not associated with the molecule anymore. And uh, the axial atoms are gone axial ligands are gone. And in that case, you're only going to have a four coordinate system and it's going to be a square planar, right? It's going to be square planar. And this is kind of cool. So now we can have a correlation diagram between a ML6 octahedral complex and an ML4 D4H square planar complex. And um, this is exactly what we were talking about earlier um, when, or, or that at least I showed you the table of, okay, the table of earlier of how square planar complex will, will split. You can see uh, the x squared minus y squared is very high in energy. And then you have a z squared by itself, an xy by itself, and the xz and yz are degenerate, right? And that's exactly what we derived here from starting with octahedral. Let's go back here, right here. Okay, EGs at the bottom there. Um, x squared minus y squared, very high in energy for square planar. Why? Direct overlap with the ligands that are in the xy plane. Okay, remember principal rotation axis defined as the z axis. So there's no ligands for square planar in the z-axis. And what's also kind of cool is you can trace out this delta O. This delta O is going to be about the same going from the dxy to the dx squared minus y squared um, when you're talking about a square planar complex. So there's a lot of interesting stuff in inorganic chemistry and transition metal complexes when you're talking about different geometries. I've just showed you one example here, which is square planar uh, complexes. But Gosh, you know, there's so much variety, and you can do the same sort of analysis with all sorts of different shapes, right? Um, it's, it's quite interesting uh, and, and remarkable kind of how simple the theories are, right? This is all MO diagrams, but we can get a lot of information from this to be used to predict structural, electronic, magnetic, and a wide variety of, of, of other properties like, like chemical reactions, okay? So eventually we're going to get there later in the course.